You've probably heard about the Belt and Road Initiative, or the BRI, initiated by China. Ten years after it was launched, over 150 countries have signed up for it. The participating countries include 75 percent of the world's population and account for more than half of the world's GDP. It received wide popularity and brought a huge number of infrastructures, especially to developing nations. But some critics believe it is just a new colonialism or debt trap from China. What is BRI? What has it achieved? Why it is valued by Global South countries? Yet demonized by some governments. As a journalist who traveled extensively in China and around the world, and see some BR projects firsthand myself, I will tell you my observations and my analysis of how the BRI can change the world. In September, I had a chance to travel to different BRI countries and see some projects myself. I went to Pakistan. Greece and Tanzania, but whether people from Asia, Europe, or Africa, they all told one same thing to me: China was the only country that was willing to invest in us when nobody else wanted to. When Pakistan was facing an economic crisis ten years ago, China was the only country that invested in Pakistan. When Greece was facing a debt crisis ten years ago, China was the only country that came to invest in Paris port. When Tanzania needed a railway. China was the only country that was willing to provide assistance. So all those critics from Western countries, where were you? Why didn't you invest in them? When I ask them, do you think BRI is just a railway colonialism, or what China is doing is new imperialism? They all said, oh, I think we are very clear what is colonialism and imperialism based on our experiences, and Chinese people. Are definitely treating us differently. I think we don't need to be told by the West what is colonialism. When we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, we have to talk about infrastructures. What can infrastructures bring? Let me tell you what me and many Chinese people have gone through. 25 years ago, when I was a kid living in Hebei Province, it took me a day and a half to go to a neighboring province, Henan Province. To visit my parents, who was then working there, the two are neighboring provinces, 945 kilometers away. I thought, damn, why the two provinces were so far away from each other? And then when I went to university, I found out my story was nothing compared to my classmate's, who is from Xinjiang. She chose not to return home during the one-month-long winter vacation, because it could take her seven to ten days. On the road, single journey, by train, by car, and probably by cattle cart all combined. And for some villagers living in southern Xinjiang, it could take them seven days on foot to visit a nearby city because the world's second largest shipping desert, the Taklimakan Desert, lay between the two cities. Two decades later, things completely changed after a massive railway network was built in China. Once the journey took me a day and a half, now it only takes three hours by high-speed rail. It only takes five hours by plane flying from Beijing to Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang. And the villagers living in southern Xinjiang can move easily now because a rail network connecting the entire Taklimakan Desert was built. And you know how many airports are there just in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region? Twenty-five. Just in one region, there are 25 airports, and they will build seven more airports. To this year, China has built 155,000 kilometers long railways, and among them, 42,000 are high-speed rail, ranks number one in the world. With infrastructures like these, villagers living in remote regions can get out of the mountains and be connected with the rest of China. These infrastructures played a crucial role in lifting the 800 million Chinese people out of extreme poverty. The reason I mention these stories is because, through our experience, we believe in the power of infrastructures. Infrastructures like railways, roads, bridges have the power to catalyze economic activity. We have an old saying in China: 
要想富，先修路 means everyone get rich, build a road first, and China did it. And now China has been sharing this know-how with other developing nations, global south countries, who have for centuries been denied the right to have these during the Western colonialism. Take Africa as an example. China has helped to build more than 6,000 kilometers long railways and roads, developed 20 ports, and 80 large power facilities across African continent. Now suddenly, the West is all eyes on China-Africa relations, thinking it's just China trapping Africa since now it's rich. But no, the relationship between China and Africa didn't just start today. They became sworn friends since decades ago. Two months ago, when I visited Tanzania, I took a ride of the Tazara Railway, which is a railway connecting Tanzania and Zambia. And that railway is a perfect example of the China-Africa brotherhood. Because it's the first railway that China aided Africa in 1970, and that railway helped some African nations to gain national independence movement. When China decided to help Tanzania and Zambia to build that railway, China itself was still an underdeveloped country, but still it provided whatever it could offer to help these nations. Chairman Mao said. We see Asia, Africa, and Latin America's victory against imperialism and colonialism as our own victory. Those people who already won the victory should assist the people who are still fighting for liberation. All countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, if they need our help, we are willing to provide it. So that's how China and Africa started their relationship, assisting each other. And something happened then is very similar to what's happening now. Because during that time, the United Kingdom, the United States, the Soviet Union, all those big powers were all invited to build that railway, but they all declined. The World Bank refused to give loans because they think building that railway requires too much investments, either money-wise or human resources-wise, and they don't think it will bring back enough profits. So they all declined, and China stepped in. Chairman Mao expressed the willingness to help. Discuss with Zambia's president Kawinda and Tanzania's president Nelele several times, and decided to provide all round of supports, from exploration, design, construction to interest-free loans. But the United Kingdom and United States didn't want to see Zambia and Tanzania work with China, even though they didn't want to help those countries. They also didn't want to see them working with other countries. So what did they do? They smeared. They slander. They are like the toxic ex. Huge smear campaign began after the three countries started this cooperation. Some British media back then would poke fun at China, believing the rail track would be made of bamboo since China has lots of bamboo. Some scholars in the United States think China lacked of the ability to build railways since it was so underdeveloped. Funny enough, the thing that the rich, developed Western countries didn't want to do. Was successfully completed by the underdeveloped China, and decades later, the tactics haven't changed. After seeing more and more countries are joining the BRI, more countries are choosing to work with China. We are seeing another huge wave of smear campaign, like the debt trap narrative. Even though, in fact, it's the debt from Western financial institutions is trapping these countries. Take Sri Lanka as an example. Sri Lanka's debt from China only account for 10% of its foreign debt, yet the debt from Western financial institutions accounts for 47%. And studies from several universities show the same, also debunk this narrative. Like the study from the Columbia University shows, what keeps African leaders awake at night is the private Western bond holders. And then we have to mention the biggest lie in this smear campaign. It's a lie about Xinjiang. In many Western countries, politicians have expressed their concerns about Muslim communities in Xinjiang, and we have to ask, why don't they care about Muslim communities in Iraq, in Syria, in Palestine, who are being bombed every day? 
yet they specifically care about the Muslim community in China's Xinjiang. On the day that a bomb was dropped on the hospital in Gaza, the United Kingdom's Ministry of Foreign Affairs finally expressed their concerns about the human rights issues, but not about people in Gaza, but about people in Xinjiang. Xinjiang was lifted out of extreme poverty. Ethnic minorities can have much higher education, their life expectancy, their population growth are all going very well. I've debunked the lies about Xinjiang many times. Please take a look at the other videos on Xinjiang on my channel. So this smear campaign, this lie about Xinjiang has two purposes. First, to drive a wedge between China and Muslim majority countries. And second, it's going after the Belt and Road Initiative. Not only because of many Muslim majority countries have joined the Belt and Road Initiative, Xinjiang's location has a strategic significance in boosting economic and trade integration between China and Central Asia, West Asia, and Europe. And let me show you where Xinjiang is on the map. Xinjiang shares borders with eight countries, Inner Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor starts from Kashgar in Xinjiang and goes through entire Pakistan. The China-Europe Freight Railway also goes through Xinjiang. It has already connected 217 countries in 25 European countries. During the pandemic, when international logistics were facing difficulty, the trade volume through this China-Europe Freight Railway still grow by 26%, and more railways going through Xinjiang are being planned. Xinjiang is the gateway of the Belt and Road Initiative. Hundreds of billions of dollars of trade volumes goes through Xinjiang. Xinjiang is a vital place for BRI and a vital place for connecting the whole of Eurasia. A vital place for finally bringing solidarity, stability, and prosperity to Eurasia, which has been for a long time been seen as a chessboard for imperial powers to gain their geopolitical interests. Luckily, this smear campaign is not working. China doubles down on developing Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Just a few weeks ago, China made Xinjiang the pilot free trade zone, means more opportunities for international cooperation on trade, technology, culture, education will take place in this place. I think it will stabilize Eurasia. In October, some world leaders flew to the other side of the world to discuss how to continue to bomb children, how to continue to bomb hospitals. Also in October, 4,000 guests from 140 countries flew to this side of the world for the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. And they were here to conduct more cooperations, make new friends, sign new deals. Find ways for win-win cooperation and no more zero-sum games. And that is what we need. Build common prosperity. And BRI can make it happen. Hey, have you signed up to my weekly newsletter yet? I've created a weekly newsletter on Substack. If you prefer reading news, if you prefer reading news about China and other international pressing issues, if you want to look beyond the mainstream talking points, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. You will have your news delivered to your email. Do you want to be a content contributor as well? If you want to get your articles, your stories, your perspectives being published, let me know. Here is my email box, jjnewsletter at hotmail.com. Let me know. If you prefer watching short videos, you can find me on TikTok. My name on TikTok is I am Li Jingjing. If you prefer interacting, discussing with people from all over the world, you can find me on Reddit. My subreddit name is News with Jingjing. If you prefer watching long videos, you can always stay here on YouTube. And you know I'm very active on Twitter as well, right? I will put the links of all my platforms in the description. I've been working as a journalist in China for more than 10 years now. I report stories related to China and also other international issues, but voices like mine are often being neglected, censored, or even attacked by Western mainstream media. I don't know, maybe one day, these Western companies probably want to erase me from their platforms. 
So it's very important that you subscribe me on multiple platforms so you can always find me. Thank you so much for supporting me for such a long time. See you next time.